All right, you got your Bible. Turn yes, to Revelation, and we are going to study the 16th chapter today. Let me conclude with the latter part of the 15th chapter, just to remind you, bring you up to the point of the 16th chapter, and where we can study this. I have used the term. I'm not sure my brothers all appreciate it, but I, this is the yucky part of Revelations. I'm telling you. We get into the last part of the last half of the tribulation and boy, the pouring out of the seven bowls of God's wrath is really devastating to the world and literally will bring the world to an end as we know it today. Look, if you will, uh, in the latter part uh, of the 15th chapter, look at the 5th verse says that I saw the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony of, of heaven was open and seven angels came out and they were clothed in pure white had breasts girded with golden girdles and such as that and uh, each one of them was given by one of the four beasts and one of the four created beings and each of them were a vow full of the wrath of God. Now that's very difficult, it's very true very in terms of saying what it's saying is the fact that the whole world is going to feel the wrath of God. Now I do want to remind you of the fact that as we shall be able to see in just a moment these bowls of wrath are poured out in the latter part of the great tribulation time. So, though it may sound like hell, this is not the punishment of hell of people after they die. This is punishment that will be poured down on this earth just before the end of the earth. In fact, verse 8 says, And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Now, I... Uh, I think that's pretty neat uh, to understand that possibly what this means is time is coming to an end and it says here that the temple will be closed neither angels nor men will be able to go in because there will be no more intercessory prayer there will be what is everybody will be having made their decision for the mark of the beast or to be sealed by the Holy Spirit at this time that the temple would not be accessible because there's no need to go there and pray because God's wrath is coming to an end as it devastates the earth that we know today. Uh, by the way, I mentioned last week to the effect that I mentioned just now about the judgment was well, not the judgment of hell, it's the judgment upon this earth. Men really do not receive the judgment of God while they're on this earth. And the Bible says, Whatsoever man sows, that shall he reap. And we reap our own sinfulness for sure and certain. And that carries with it what we might want to call the wrath of God. In other words, we disobedient, we've got to pay the consequences of our sin. But this is not hell. This is what we're going to experience at the end of this earth existence. And this seems to almost be an exception to God's rule, where we actually, men, do not receive the judgment of God until the day of judgment itself. Here in this latter part of the tribulation, the judgment of God does fall upon man. So. I just bring you to that point of understanding because as we get into the 16th chapter it talks about these angels that are given the seven bowls of God's wrath to be poured out uh, upon the earth now and we'll see what each one of these uh, wraths consists of. Uh, I gave you all last week a little old simple thing but it's no big deal to it right here that shows if y'all got that remember all that is is showing how during the Egyptian plague and during the blowing of the trumpets and the 
pouring out the seventh vials, there are many similar kind of plagues taking place. Now, I have made mention several times to the effect that it appears, as you go through the book of Revelation, as we've studied up to this point, that some of this may be the same picture just looked at from a different angle. That some of these things that are happening upon the earth uh, that John observes by the Spirit of God there might be the same thing just looked at it at a different time. However, when we get to these seven bowls, it's very obvious that these are in succession to the others. That this, we're not looking at the same plagues and we can see that this is not the same as the blowing of the trumpets, although they may be similar. Uh, now, uh, I again say there's a problem many times in trying to determine in the book of Revelation what is to be taken literal and what is to be taken as symbolic. Obviously, it's symbolic that God pours out the vial, the angels pour out the vial. That's a symbol of God's breath covering the whole earth. However, the effects of the pouring out of souls of wrath seem to be very literal as you compare to some of the others and especially as you compare to the plagues that happened in the land of Egypt prior to the release of the children of Israel. Nobody doubts but that was very literal that these plagues were actual plagues that happened and that appears to be the similarity between them seems to mean that these same plagues are literal plagues. Pouring out the bowls is symbolic, obviously, but the actual plagues themselves could be taken very literal. All right, let's read now in the 16th chapter and see what it has to say. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your way and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Now, uh, I might have mentioned the other day, last Sunday, but I, I want this to be understood. Though these plagues are similar to some of the other the plagues for the blowing of the trumpet, yet at the same time, uh, it speaks then that uh, a third of the earth would be basically affected, the third of the sea would be turned into blood, you know, and all of this one third. Uh, the animals would die and all that kind of stuff. But here, in this final pouring out of the bowls of wrath of God, everything, there is everything is devastated and brought to an end. There are no limits placed upon the effects of the bowls that are poured out. In fact, when you get down to the seventh bowl, it's very obvious that's the end of time. That comes to an absolute end. All right, let's look. Verse two. That is, this is one question. Yes. Oh, uh, and I may have missed it earlier. The voice coming from the temple would that be God or would that be Christ or do we know? We don't know whether it's actually the voice of God, but it, it could very definitely mean. However, the very idea that it says it's coming from the temple means it is from God. It's a message That's from what I God. Was yeah. Whether it's actually the voice of Jesus speaking or an angel speaking or who, but it is absolutely the uh, message from God Himself. Yes. Now at this point there's still some Christians left on earth. Yes. Right. Right. Now, I, will that affect them? And, well, we're going to look at that. Uh, okay. yeah, we're going to look at that <laughs> out here. There, there cannot be a whole bunch of Christians left on the earth at this time. And we talked about last week to the effect that what's happening, the Antichrist is thinking that he's putting these people to death and he's having victory over them. And then we took last week, it says, the victory belonged to the Christians. Whenever every one that the Antichrist thought he was punishing by murdering them, martyring them. Actually, what he did, he just sent them to be with the Lord. He, that was actually victory. We talked about that last week. Mm -hmm. Folks, we don't ever, as Christians, have to fear death. 
Death is victory. 1 Corinthians 15 speaks of that. That when we die, now are those that die in the tribulation, when you die as a Christian, you experience victory. Okay? So get that part of it down for sure. All right, let's look at verse 2. And the first went out. This is the first of these angels with the bowls of wrath. And poured out his vials upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon men. The men which had the mark of the beast. And upon them that which worshipped his image. Again, this is God's wrath upon the Antichrist and his followers here. Now, again, I would remind you that all of the scholars appear looking at it from a premillennial vantage point, that is, that the church has been removed already, that all of those that are following the Antichrist and the dragon and such and the false witness, that these are the recipients of this wrath. And it says the first thing that happened is that everyone of them received sores. Now, um, I, I think that's it's the same thing that in Egypt when he talked about the sores, the word is boils. In other words, they have boils all over their body. And uh, this you're talking about the Christians that were there. This does not affect the Christians, those that are sealed with the Holy Spirit versus the, uh, this. But these are those that have made a commitment of their lives to the Antichrist, to the dragon. And so the first thing that happens is they're going to have major, major sores. Now, uh, it, it does say here that it comes upon those with the mark of the beast and those that worship his, in, his image. And we talked about that already time past. But this says that it's definitely during the tribulation period, in the latter part of the tribulation, last three and a half, because it's when the dragon is placed upon the throne, as it were. We talked about it in the temple that he was to be worshipped. He declared himself to be God. And so what it's saying here is this happens in that experience. So it had to be during the last three and a half years of the tribulation because that's when Satan declared himself to be God. Now we looked at that, that, that the image could possibly be the image of the Antichrist. The Antichrist was a man, a person that was thought so well of and all of that, and many believe that actually that the Antichrist died at the end of the first three and a half years, but then that the Satan took his image upon himself, so to speak, and so that he could receive the direct worship of the followers, uh, his followers there. So, but the point I want to make is you understand this definitely says that these bowls of wrath are pouring, being poured out upon the earth. This is not hell because, and it's during the last three and a half years of it. Uh, the, anyway, all right, anybody? Got a statement or question, please speak of it. All right, let's go to the next verse. Uh, and the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. Uh, this is a really a predicament. Uh, the blowing of the second trumpet, the Bible says that we read in Revelations, the blowing of the second trumpet caused a third of the sea to turn to blood. But here, the pouring out of the vial speaks of all the sea. Now, even in the first one, it could have been because of the familiarity of the recipients of this letter, it could have been referring to the Mediterranean Sea, actually. But here, it's obviously it's talking about the oceans and everything, everything. That that's a lot of dead moment. fish. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's a lot of dead fish. Well, <laughs> what I, confuses I, I, me I, is it says every soul. Every yeah. soul 
That's the confusing part. Right. It, it is. The word there, and, and you got to be careful. So, the Bible speaks of living soul. Living creatures. The Bureau says living creatures. That's really what it is. They, they use, T. James uses the term soul, but uh, the Bible speaks in the creation time that God created all the animals and then He made man a living soul. Right. Mm -hmm. Which represents His familiarity or his likeness to God himself. But here that word is used, but it's really the creatures that uh, is, is being referred to here. Now, yeah, you I, um, I googled it and it says kills all marine life. Alright, that's what he's talking about here. Now can you quite imagine, if you don't know it, there's a lot of marine life. There's a lot of life in the ocean and in the sea. Now, as you mentioned, can you imagine when this, the Bible says that here uh, it became as blood. By the way, don't let that disturb you. Whether it was real blood or whether it was the likeness of blood God created, it was a very corrupt thing that killed everything in it. I mean, I don't think we need to try to think in terms of literal blood, though it's obviously some sort of corrupt experience that these seeds went through to kill all the life in it. But can you imagine? No, we cannot. All of the living creatures dying and rising to the surface and beginning to stink. Can you imagine the odor no. that would cover the whole earth at a time like this? I mean, it, it has to affect every, everybody. I mean, uh, the unbearable stinks and possible disease that come from this kind of experience. Uh, I, I don't think there could be any, and we, we look at the earth now, similar to like this today, except going under this, I don't think you could have commercial shipping and uh, it, it would really create a, a problem in every sense of the word whenever two-thirds of the earth would be covered in some sort of blood as it refers to here and every creature in it dies. Ooh. Yeah. I give you an example 70% of the earth is covered in water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At a minimum 12,500 feet deep, a maximum 35,800 feet deep. That's a lot of creatures. You ain't kidding. To you come ain't to the surface kidding. and rock. I mean, it's just a lot of fascinating. Uh, in fact, I get absolutely, I was the other day, I was looking some of the weird, I use that term, fish that are in the ocean. Beautiful things, different colors and shapes and they cannot and to think how creative God was in allowing these creatures to come upon the earth and how uh, you know, we get to behold their beauty and magic. They're still creatures down there we don't even know of. We don't even know about, them, right? I mean, they're creatures down deep, they say, they never come to the surface and are totally blind because it's really dark and such as that. I, I, just, I just don't know, but this is a devastating kind of experience. Now, add them up while you're going. All the sores on their body, and then all of a sudden all the steak in the air and all the, the, the creatures dying. Boy. As has been said a thousand times in our study of Revelations, I'm glad I won't be here. Mm -hmm. And they won't have any more fish to eat? No. No, they won't be able to declare fish fry. Right. <laughs> that we're going to have. All right. Look at the next, let's look at verses 4 through 7. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, 
who art and was and shall be, because thou hast judged this thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous art thou judgment. All right, the third angel pours out his bowl of God's wrath upon the whole earth. And it says that the rivers, the springs, that is, can we, we might want to make the distinction, the salt water first, now the fresh water, all becomes blood, just the, the, the fresh water. Now, the fresh water, you know, that's talking about our rivers, Mississippi River and all of that, and it deals with the idea of uh, the water that we drink, we bathe, it would just be a drought of actual water. Now, the people that are here better hope that there are a lot of bottles of water put up and tanks or something, because <coughs> can you imagine? Those, who's to say those don't turn to it too? You know? <laughs> can you imagine? Well, I'm assuming it's also going to affect the uh, aquifers underground. Yeah, water. Well, well water. I all mean, everything all is well water, you know. So, yeah. one of the thoughts came to me: Can you imagine that you talk? We will see people shooting each other and fighting and everything over minor little things. Mm. But there, a bottle of water, one, one jar of water. I ain't not kill each other over trying who's gonna get that jar of water because it's unavailable. But the idea is that that the water that normally would be used in terms of something like drinking, the normal water, the rivers and seas, uh, that would be I guess a form of poison mm -hmm. is what it would amount to. Mm -hmm. And they would not be able uh, nobody would be able to drink it. So you can obviously see how chaotic the world's getting. Again, add them up from the shores, and then we looked at the sea, and now the rivers and springs all turning to blood. Uh, there's something very interesting I kind of run across. I mentioned it last week at 18th verse, where he talked about the, the one that had the angel that had power over fire. But look here, and this is excessive. In verse 5, and I heard the angel of the waters. Sometimes we talk about and actually kind of wonder. I believe in angels. I think there are angels right here in this room. We may not be able to see them. I'm a, I'm a firm believer in God having a personal, giving a personal angel to everybody, a guardian angel. But they do all sorts of things in this world. Yeah take care of God's creation and man, called man. But here it speaks of the angel of the water as if maybe an angel was responsible for water that we, most of us would get that there's an angel sees that it's distributed amongst those that need it. Not, not just like we would think, but anyhow, it speaks of the angel of the waters so, it was this angel, when the waters were turned to blood, that the angel of the waters, that watched over the waters, said, God, you're righteous in doing this. It's good for you to turn the water into blood. I, I, he's saying, I guess, in essence, I'm the angel of the water, but you're doing the right thing by turning it into blood. Because of look, how so many of your saints, so many of your prophets have shed their blood and now they're having to drink blood. If they're going to drink from the rivers and the waters, they're going to have to, they're going to, have to actually drink the blood of these. Uh, and said they deserve it. After the way man has responded and treated God in all his love and mercy, his sending of his son to die on the cross and men rebelling and looking, 
look at it as it goes in here today. Uh, Christianity is such a minority and getting to be more of a minority. I was reading and I came to a, and I didn't read this, but I, I got, I, I, my own studies, we're going to get it later in this same chapter. I don't know how far we'll make it today, but in this same chapter about the kings of the east coming across the Euphrates River and it's talking about Armageddon, that it appears, my, in my way of thinking, some of this could be simply what is building up right now. Christians are hated people, and that is found more, it's being found more and more in the Orient, but it's found in other parts of the world, that they gather together, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, <laughs> but they gather together on what is called Armageddon Battle, could actually be all of the this non-Christian world, especially your inner world, coming together to wipe out Christianity because all this evil things that are happening upon the earth here during the tribulation, they're blaming Christians for it. You're responsible for it. And it could be that the gathering of these enemies, these kings from the east with their armies, could be an attempt to finally wipe out Christianity to try to obliterate it completely. That would stop it. But I'm getting ahead of myself there. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get back to that. All right. But the idea is that even from the altar, there's a voice that said, Lord God, you are true and righteous in the judgment that you give. So, ugh, I wouldn't want to be on the earth during this thing. All right. Look. Uh, let's see. Is there anything else I want to share on that? I'm not looking at my notes. Sometimes kind of. Now let's go on to verses 8 and 9. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given <clears throat> unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat. And how did they respond? And blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him the glory. Uh, this is a very interesting one. Of course, we saw some of this in Egypt, whatever, the darkness that came upon the earth. Well, we'll talk about darkness afterwards. But here, uh, though a third of the sun supposedly was darkened, yet the heat that radiated out from the sun became so intense that people were burning up. I don't know what kind of temperature they're having, but, you know, we get kind of frustrated <coughs> And I say at 12 o'clock we were headed home for fishing because the weather was getting so hot. We didn't want to get out there in that heat. All of us have gone through experiences where we get too hot. We still do it at time. It's a very uncomfortable thing. But here he's talking about a sun-induced heat wave such as never been experienced before. And people are going to literally be burning, as it were. Uh, with, with this great heat, uh, I'm telling you, it's, it's something. Now, I was interested in just a little phrase, a little part of it, but the idea, you remember, that uh, the water's turned to blood now. And here the heat comes. It's kind of remin reminiscent to me of Luke 16, remember where person in hell cried out, would you send this cripple to take dip his finger in water and give me one drop of water? Yeah, on my tongue, yeah. yeah. Now, there's this heat wave here on this earth that people are going to be crying for water. And there is no water to be able to drink, to yeah. Being oh. thirsty is, is worse than being hungry. Mm -hmm. Too. That's right. And you can see that, you know, just a portion of that, what how it would affect people. Because right now, you know, over in the southwest, I mean, they are having a drought over there. The lakes are drying up. They're at the lowest point they've been ever 
you know, and I mean the whole, the whole, the whole place was running out of water, you know, because everybody decided to live in the desert. <laughs> you know, so I mean, it's crazy going on over there now. Just a slight example, when I was in Texas, Lake Houston almost dried up. Right. They had to open up Lake Conroe to drain down to Lake Houston to get the city water. Right. It was horrible. Mm. <laughs> That's just oh, a glimpse of yeah, it's going to happen. Yeah, just a very you know? minute. <laughs> That rain sounded pretty good last time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and we got more coming today, obviously, it seems like. Uh, one very interesting thing here that it says, these people are suffering so. I mean, here, the fourth angel has poured out his plague, and every one of these experiences of the wrath of God against sin upon this earth. Each one makes it worse and worse as they accumulate as you add it to it. I mean, it looks like that people would fall on their knees and cry out for mercy. Cry out for God. You do, you know, save me. Deliver me from this. I can't have it. Did you? Hear mm -hmm. what it said here. Instead of crying out in mercy, turning to God, they blaspheme the name of God. I mean, and they refuse to repent of their sins. Uh, I have to look somewhere. I think I was. Uh, it speaks to the fact that they. Repented not, and here and, and, and the next uh, bowl will be a similar thing. Uh, I, I got to thinking, and, and I got some notes here in the next one. But uh, the idea being that you would think that people uh, that experience some judgment of sin. The wrath of God here on earth then, but even even the truth I was talking about a while ago, whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. It looked like people, whenever they would, and of course we got obvious things like alcohol and drugs and illicit sex, such as that, is how this affects people and, and uh, makes life so miserable for them. You would think they would turn to God. But instead, it seems like that so often they curse God and blame God for the things that they themselves are responsible for. Now, I, I tell you, this coming around to me, and you know, uh, as I was thinking about it, that really, uh, when men reject God, they don't turn back to God because of the suffering or punishment that they have, that they receive. Lost people mostly, and, I, and there are exceptions in the room, but lost people respond to the love of God, not the judgment of God. And this is what is happening. And a good example of this is uh, the study of people in prisons and jails. You'd think after they were incarcerated and suffered for years and years, you'd think that they would want to say, hey, I'm sorry for that. I don't want that to happen again. I'm going to turn and change my life. And most of them end up going right back into prison or jail after they get out. Men do not come to God, so to speak, because of judgment, because of their what they experience as a result of it. They would rather blame God and blaspheme the name of God and really curse God for what their experience is rather than understanding and accepting the fact that it's a result of their sins. And this is what God sent his son to do is relieve us of that sin and the punishment of it. Ooh, it, it, it's 
when you hard. look at the children of Israel when they come out of Egypt, it was the same thing. I mean, all those plagues yeah. on Egypt, and then you know, he, you would think, that, oh, man, let's worship your God. Your God is greater than my God. And what he did, got mad, went out, tried to kill them all, and what he did, God wiped him out. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. But the well, ironical part about that is they built they built the idol. Mm -hmm. By that they had to what went back to what they were used to doing. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Men hadn't changed. <laughs> right. Yeah, I would just say it seemed to me like that something like what we're reading here, the suffering that comes from the pouring out of the bowls of God's wrath, would bring men to their knees. And I mean in repentance and mercy, begging for mercy and grace. But instead, they curse God. Uh, I like of this. Uh, the Bible speaks of an unforgivable sin. But listen, when Jesus died, it covered all sin. Anybody can turn into repentance of their sin, no matter who, how bad that sin was, and come to know Jesus as a Savior. But what happens when I consider and I'm putting it in terms of what we're doing today. The unforgivable sin is not that God cannot forgive it, but it's that man lets himself get in such a position to where he will not ask God. He will not repent of his sins. And this is what we're talking about here. When people, even in this life, there are those that have what we call that unforgivable sin under death itself, that they get to the point in their lives where they're never going to hear the Holy Spirit. They're not going to respond to the movement of the Holy Spirit. And when things happen, rather than ask for mercy, they curse God. And God cannot forgive them for that particular reason. But this seems to be so evident whenever you've got the, the this last half of the tribulation and Things have gotten to such a point it's time is just about to come to an end. And they're suffering greater than anybody has ever suffered physically upon this earth, maybe, normally for the earth population. And yet they curse God instead of repenting. Hmm. How awful. Well, let's look at the fifth angel. We're going to quit in just a few minutes here. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. And his kingdom was filled, was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Ooh, exactly what we're just saying. It just goes on and on and on. This judgment here uh, says that, that, that when the... <coughs> This bowl of God's wrath is poured out that it caused the darkness of, uh, and, and the seed of the beast. Now this is a reference in, I want to go back to, it was good, but probably Babylon, whether it's used called by that term, but it's probably the throne where the throne of the Antichrist is and the record of the seed of evil. Uh, upon this earth at this time during the tribulation when it seems that Babylon was revived and that's where the Antichrist worked out from and all of, that this was completely engulfed in darkness and uh, that's hard to conceive of. We, we say it gets dark every night here but you know it doesn't really get dark if you go out in it yeah, a little bit. We got the moon. We got a little bit of light from the stars, but just in general speaking, uh, it, it, it's not so bad. Have you ever, any of you ever been to Carlsbad Cavern? I went to a cavern when they turned well, out the lights. But it's, there's others, yes. It's dark. Uh, it's <laughs> dark. Where it gets you way back down. You can't, you can't see that. You know, I went there and you, you get way back in there and they turn the lights out. And I mean, like you, you can't hold your hand there and see your hand right there. 
when darkness really comes, it, it's bad, 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 bad business like that. And this seems to indicate that this is what is happening here. It says this happened upon the seat of the Antichrist and the evil forces of that day. Maybe this was not a worldwide total darkness, we don't know, but it, the darkness begins to heal. And what do men say? God, you're a terrible God. Give us pains and sores. And they gnaw their tongues for pain. But they would not repent. They would not repent of their sins. I'm telling you, that, that is a, a really a, a awful We're going to have to call it quits here, but that, that is so awful in terms of the kind of suffering. We that live, I want to say here just in Louisiana, but we who uh, are experiencing what we do today as difficult as this old world may be that we live in, it ain't nothing compared to what this tribulation period is going to be. And we're coming, in fact, it's believed right here, and we'll see this when we come back next week, that we're talking about the last days of the existence of this earth because it's all going to be finished, the Bible says, and it will be over and done. And never, never, never has there been a person made in the image of God that were no matter how deep they were in but that they could be saved if they came to trust Jesus and yet we're reading here of what really amounts to millions of people that suffer and die and refuse to give their heart to Jesus that's sad